how can we how can we participate in that as designers? Because at the end of the day, we always go back to okay, as designers, what is our role uh, in this larger conversation? Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today at Obsessed Show, I am chatting with Jesse McGuire, the managing director at brand design studio Thought Matter, leading a team of artists, writers, and strategists to create daring designs and identities for everything from art museums, communities, and brands to a range of institutions and organizations. She's been an integral and part of shaping the purpose and creative vision of Thought Matter, spearheading projects and campaigns that reflect the agency's culture and mission, including protest posters for the 2017 Women's March, modern redesign of the U.S. Constitution, and the recently launched For the People docuseries. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Jesse McGuire. Okay, kids, all the way from Brooklyn, I'm chatting today with Jesse McGuire. Jesse. Welcome to Obsessed Show. Hi, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Well, it's awesome to have you here. And I want to talk a whole bunch about Thought Matter. But first, my first question to ask everybody is always about their origin stories. But I I think it's important in the world that we're in right now that this is like week one of COVID shut in designing in our sweatpants. Um, How are you doing right now? Yeah, so... I don't know. I, I'm I'm trying to to sort through all the things that are happening. I know I was excited to come on your podcast, and then I got a note yesterday that was like, "We're still recording," and I was like, "What am I going to do? I have <laughs> still recording what? <laughs> still recording what? About what?" So, um, you know, I have I have two kids. I have a husband. It's working from home times four. Uh, I think I have told a bunch of people this, but I've never had to deal with four different Zoom meetings, but I have a two-year-old who has Zoom meetings with her daycare. I have Zoom meetings with my uh, six-year-old who's fully on a uh, uh, online learning platform. My husband, who is a DOE um, Department of Education teacher here in New York City, who has to figure out and navigate Zoom with his high schoolers who are just wanting to graduate. So... Yeah, when I was like, oh, I'm going to record a podcast, who's going to be here with me? But my husband just left with both kids, the dog's here. Uh, so this is going to be an hour of just actually alone time with you. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Well, um, I hope everyone is doing all right out there who is listening. Um, hopefully when this episode goes live, we'll be able to smile fondly and think, oh yeah, that's when it was crazy, but it's better now. Um, but fingers crossed that we, we end up in a good spot here in the near future. Um, but let's go ahead and jump into the the typical interview here. Um, I want to know about your, your origin story and really how you found yourself in this world of design and branding and, and all things that you work on. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I, I love, I love the term origin story. When I was little, I always imagined myself as Superman uh, because Superman was one of the only characters out there that was adopted. Mm. Uh, If you know, he came from um, Krypton, right? Krypton, yeah, (laughs) came from Krypton and and landed in the backyard and and was raised by a really loving couple. So not quite the same for me, but I was adopted from El Salvador, um, single parent household, came over when I was about 20 months and uh, grew up in upstate New York, grew up uh, in an Italian Ukrainian household. So I definitely thought I was Italian. Um, I'm not, but I uh, thought I was. <laughs> and uh, my mom is amazing. She's a school teacher, 40 years, and told me I could do anything and be anything. And I believed her. So I told her I wanted to go to art school. And I think she said to herself, well, that's not exactly what I meant when I said you could do anything. <laughs> Um, but no, but supported me uh, and said that even though I might not be able to, um, you know, have a, uh, she kept saying a typical career, she really believed that I'd be able to, to find, uh, find my way. So I went to Pratt. I was lucky, very, very lucky uh, that, uh, you know, she, she had a lot of sacrifices to make sure that I could, could go to Pratt. Student Plus loans, all kinds of things, sold our house. So I was able to do my four years there, undergraduate uh, advertising in the communications design department. And um, 
when I graduated, I went into, I, I worked a little bit in advertising, realized I didn't like it, did a little bit of fashion, realized I didn't like it. Uh, and then went into graphic design and realized that was what I wanted to do. I loved uh, being a designer, working on campaigns. Uh, at the time, it was some websites, very early websites, uh, and knew that that's what I wanted to be a part of. I wanted to be part of design, graphic design, communications. Um, and then I got a little antsy and I had a chance to apply to the master's in branding program. It was mm -hmm. the first year of the first of its kind master's in branding program at the School of Visual Arts uh, yeah, with, nice. Debbie Mil with Debbie Millman. Uh, and it was incredible. Uh, had an amazing nine months of uh, intense studying of things that no one even knew you could study. So like, what is branding? Um, and then after I graduated, I had a, a tremendous opportunity to go work at Kimberly Clark. I had, I had a mentor, uh, Christine Mao, who I had stalked. Uh, I had stalked while I was in grad school because I was uh, slightly obsessed with all the work she was doing on U by Kotex and Kleenex. And um, I just kept seeing her at conferences and I was emailing her and she finally uh, she actually knew Debbie Millman and she finally was like, I think you need a mentor. I think you need somebody to help you. Uh, so <laughs> I got to know her in her work and was given the, again, tremendous opportunity to, to work at Kimberly Clark. Uh, I had to move out to Wisconsin. I mm. didn't know much about the Midwest, but I had a chance to uh, go out there, lived there for three years, made some incredible friends, learned a lot about the corporate world, learned a lot about CPG, consumer packaged goods. Um, a lot I about cheese. A lot about cheese, a lot about <laughs> beer, a lot about babies, because I ended up having one out there. Um, and I ended up coming back to uh, New York, actually, after I had my first baby, because I, I wanted to be closer to family and uh, realized that I wanted to, to raise a child in New York City. So I came back, uh, and but I had a chance to work on um, strategy on the brand side. So I wasn't necessarily doing design anymore. Uh, instead, I was supporting the really amazing designers doing the work uh, from a strategy standpoint, helping to put together uh, you know, brand frameworks and all the things that big CPG firms like to hear. And then four years ago, I had a chance to do some consulting uh, with this company called Thought Matter, which at, at the time was about a year old. And they wanted me to come in and help uh, really frame up the strategy offering for uh, CPG um, CPG clients, because that was my background. Uh, but I had the chance to get to know the founder of the firm who doesn't have a background in CPG packaging. He actually has a, a background in uh, journalism, reporting, uh, fine art, um, philanthropy. And so when I asked him, why, are, why do you want to be working on... CPG, like consumer packaged goods. And he was like, well, that's branding. Branding is what's in the supermarket. <laughs> right. And I was like, that's not true. Uh, so really for the last four years, been working through what is branding in the 21st century as we get into the third decade of this century, like what and how can you use branding and how can you use it for uh, not your typical, what you would call brands, but the people and organizations that are doing work uh, that's making an impact. Well, let's, um, let's dive into that a little bit. Like, so when you, when you talk about brand strategy and your role, <laughs> what, what does a normal day look like for you and how much of your time are you spending focused on strategy still? Or are you getting into, you know, illustrator or Adobe products and moving pixels around and vectors and, um, or, or is most of your time more administrative and meetings like, you know, rewind us a week or two to, <laughs> to when normal was normal. Um, what, what did that look like? Yeah. Uh, what was normal? Um, no. So I would say over the past four years uh, it's, it's changed. When I first uh, came on board at Thought Matter, it really was digging into what is a strategy offering. Uh, it was a lot of business development. It was really, again, I went out on a limb and told our founder that I believed we could build a business on doing work worth doing. Uh, I said we could build a business on working with community-based organizations, uh, cultural institutions, arts organizations, education. Um, now, mind you, I didn't actually know if you could build a business on those things. I just knew that's what we <laughs> should be doing. As designers, I just feel that the... Um, the capacity for creativity is so needed in those areas that I just believed that that 
was true. Uh, so in the first couple of years, it was really, how do we reach out to those organizations? Um, it actually was a lot of branding 101. Um, I thought, oh, if I just call up this really wonderful organization that's working with refugee women, they're going to, of course, want to work with us. And I realized that they were like, well, that sounds all great, but like, what is branding? What is marketing? What are the things mm -hmm. that you really could offer to us? And how does that help us do fundraising? How does that help us do more work? And so I spent a lot of time really thinking through how do you talk about branding? How do you make an offering, quote unquote, uh, sure. for organizations that uh, want to bring in money, but they want to use that money to be able to further their, their work? Um, so that was the first part of, of my time there. And I did still have all the Adobe. Uh, I had the creative cloud, all the suite on my computer. So I would play an illustrator. The designers would tell me to stop, <laughs> stop playing <laughs> an illustrator. Um, and really in the last year or two, as I've taken on more, um, I would say management of building teams, supporting our creative director, uh, supporting our client service team, supporting our founder. Uh, I've done a lot less in those. And actually this past year, they took away my creative suite. <laughs> was, That'll um, teach you. It will teach me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I realized that I didn't need necessarily need a license for, you know, them. but, um, just download I, another free trial. You'll yeah. be, <laughs> I know back in my art school right days. Uh, uh, so yeah. Well, so just on how you, um, you talked about like these nonprofits saying, well, why do we need branding and what is that? And how does that help us raise more money? How would you pitch that? Like what, what did that sound like from thought matter and from you? Yeah, no, absolutely. So one of the things that I think is a, is a misconception of a nonprofit is it's oh, a nonprofit doesn't want to make money. And even those in the nonprofit sector sometimes say that they're like, we're not about making money. Uh, but what I realized after talking to quite a few uh, folks in and around nonprofits, and especially those that are giving money to nonprofits, they're like, well, no, they want and need to make money. It's how they use that money in order to further, again, that work that they're doing or that impact. So I would always start a conversation with somebody and I would say, you know, just to understand where their, their frame of reference was, was, you know, where are you in your fundraising? Where are you in your growth? Where are you in what your, um, you, you know, what your vision plans, visioning plans are. And I actually think that would sometimes throw, throw them off because they'd be like, wait a second, this is a design studio asking me about my three year, five year visioning plan. Of yeah. course I have one. Um, and you know, I would talk to them having read their annual reports because I'd have an understanding of where they were putting their money, how they were spending it. Uh, and so I think it allowed them to feel comfortable, like, okay, she does understand that this is a, this is a business. And then they would be really curious, like, okay, well, what can design do for us? What can, um, what can marketing do? And so then it would be talking to them about where they were with their, their visual brand identity. Where were they with their communications plan? Where were they thinking um, or were they thinking holistically about how uh, they were showing up in the world and how they were able to fundraise? Uh, and one of the things that uh, Thought Matter always goes back to is this phrase of work worth doing. So if it is work worth doing, you have to understand what the work is, um, you have to understand what the worth, like what is the value of that work? Um, and then how are you actually doing it? How is it showing up in the world? Uh, so it would always be um, it's kind of a circular conversation and always going back to what their larger mission was. So we had a great client uh, that we've been working with for the past few years um, called Girl Forward. Uh, they work with refugee girls. And uh, we had a really wonderful conversation with them about their annual appeal letter. And they would just send out a letter every year and, and hope uh, that they would, um, you know, people, people would respond. And it was definitely their, their, their loyalists. And we had this really uh, fun idea for them to do a, new, um, a zine and we said, well, you have all these really wonderful high school girls that want to talk about their culture. They want to talk about the work that they're doing. What if you took their stories and you made a really, uh, you know, quick and down and dirty type of zine and you actually sent that out as your annual appeal? Um, and they were like, oh, well, do you think that folks would be interested in those stories? And we're like, absolutely. So we helped them. We ended up printing like 500 of them. We worked with the girls to put it together uh, and they sent it out and they, uh, Double more than doubled uh, what they got the year before mm, on the annual appeal. So awesome! 
Yeah. And so it really shows that not only can design, but then that creativity of the girls and their stories impact their donors because their donors are now saying, wow, my hundred dollars, my thousand dollars going to this organization, I'm seeing a direct impact uh, in how these girls are, are viewing themselves and how they're, how they are uh, just developing as, as young women. So um, I feel like that was a long winded way of saying yeah, work with doing design's important. <laughs> that's super cool though. Um, and I love the idea of like activating the girls and their work and their creativity to pitch how to get involved and how to raise money and why. And I think that's, that's really cool. Um, so I was looking a little bit on the thought matter website and, uh, it, at my best guess, you've got like 15 ish, uh, headshots on the about us page or head head illustrations in your case. Um, how is, how is thought matter staff? Like are, are most of those design professionals or like what, what's kind of the breakdown of your team? Yeah, absolutely. So the team right now, it actually, um, in the management part, I have to think through like the different seats and how many people we have, right. but we have about 10, um, yeah, I think 10 design seats, if you will. So we have, um, and we flux, we use a lot of uh, freelancers. Mm -hmm. I think we have seven full-time designers and then, um, freelancers who come in and out. We love our freelancers. We always start with like, come work with us for a couple of weeks. Then we're like, stay four months. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the design team for me is, is uh, such, a, such an important piece of it. And I have an amazing creative director, Ben Greengrass, who really has cultivated and built that team over the last two years. Uh, and then we have a client services team uh, who there, um, th there's three, three of them. Um, Martha Kirby, who's our client services director, works with an account manager and a producer uh, to get everything done. And they're fantastic. Uh, and then, the strategy team, which is like my, um, like my, I call them the mighty, mighty, the small but mighty strategy team. Uh, that's where a lot of my, you know, my background is. So I, I really um, feel such a uh, allegiance to them. Uh, we have a cultural strategist who's unbelievably amazing. Uh, she started with us right out of grad school and said she wanted to be a strategist. And then we had her develop her own. Um, her own job description. She came back with cultural strategy and I was like, yeah, hired. Let's do it. Let's see what that's <laughs> about. Uh, and then we have a uh, integrated brand strategist who is amazing. He's actually been with Thought Matter for I think the five years that it's been around. He started as an intern. He's had seven titles and he, he's <laughs> now landed on brand integrated brand strategist, which I like that he has. And then we have a design strategist uh, and then we love interns. We have at, mm. the, at the moment we have uh, two interns, a design intern, a marketing intern. We've had high school interns, and um, you know we just love bringing in young people to to work with us. So that's really the breakup of the team. So it's creative, uh, a, cl a client service, strategy, and then we have the operations folks who help us get everything done. The backbone, as I like to call them, so helping with finances and HR and making sure people have snacks. <laughs> right. Um do you feel like that's a pretty intentional size for you guys? Will you kind of, kind of camp out at that size and, or are you trying to triple over the next few years or what, what's kind of the strategy there? Yeah, no, I never, um, going into this, I never thought about a strategy of the size of a team. Uh, but over the past few years, I realized how important that is, uh, to be really intentional with growth and really intentional with how, uh, the, the team, um, kind of, flux uh, and moves over, over time. Well, through the magic of editing, you guys don't even know that we just let the dog out and took like a little break to adjust the microphone and everything. So this is, this is lots of fun, but we're going to jump into our next question here, which is really around, you know, I want to talk about some projects. I want to, I want to hear about this redesign of the constitution. Um, was that just a sort of a personal project for you guys? Or was that um, something that you got brought in to help on? Yeah, absolutely. So the constitution was a uh, project by Thought Matter. Um, so when we started it in 2017, we kept calling it a passion project. I would say now as we move into 2020, uh, it's less of a, for me, it's less of a passion project and more of a, a, a fundamental um, piece of uh, creativity that we do. But in 2017, we as a staff at the time, we were a little bit smaller. So we probably had about 10, 12, 12 of us, uh, mostly millennials, uh, though 
we have rebranded ourselves to Millenni Heirs, which is a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, and we, coming out of the election, were all just besides ourselves as to what just happened. Our founder, Tom, who's amazing, who's a boomer, he'll hate that I said that, but he is, uh, was like, you all need to get up off the floor and start thinking about how you're going to use your design skills for good. And we were like, well, what do you mean good? And he's like, I protested. I did that. You know, he went, he went into like all the things mm, that he, right. he did back in um, the, I guess, the 60s. Uh, and we ended up doing protest posters for the Women's March. And at the time, the Women's March wasn't the Women's March as we know it. It was like, oh, there's going to be some women going down to D.C. Uh, but... Tom was like, yeah, the posters and the the visuals and how people think about uh, civic engagement is so important. And you guys could create these really cool posters. So we did a Kickstarter and we ended up uh, uh, printing over 10,000 posters and distributing them across the country. And so that was our first taste of like, oh my gosh, as designers, not only can we create something that we'll see across the world, but we also can use platforms like um, Kickstarter to actually get get the, the project out there, get the word out there. So after that, and we saw the money rolling in, uh, of course, it probably you know covered maybe three quarters of the printing, but uh, we were so excited uh, <laughs> that we said, well, what do we want to do next? What can we do next? Um, and we had a, a huge team brainstorm and said, okay, do we want to do more posters? Do we want to do postcards? Do we want to, you know, this, that, the other thing. And, uh, somebody was like, well, the, the, the president keeps talking about all these different things. Has he read the constitution? Does he even know what it is? And again, now it sounds kind of quaint. This was back in 2017 when we were just getting started with, um, what this administration is, is capable or not capable of, but we, uh, then we're like, well, who's read the Constitution? And so we ordered a bunch and then said, well, the, the first thing is how do you make it more accessible? How do you make this a document that people want to read? How do you make this a document that people want to even pick up or have a, an understanding of? And so we're like, yeah, let's let's definitely uh, use our skills. So we went down a whole rabbit hole of like, could, do we look at the, amend, the different amendments, the different um, uh, rulings that have come down? And then we realized it would have been very partisan uh, a partisan active, you know, approach. Uh, and we didn't want to go down that route. So we talked to a, a constitutional law expert from NYU or yeah, I think it was NYU. And he said, well, just take the unamended text, like the text as is from the library of Congress, take that text, don't add any spin to it and just design it in a way that makes sense. So we then, because we're a branding studio and we have our, you know, wonderful process, we strategized how we could do it. And we launched the campaign on July 4th and said we want to get as many people to support uh, the Constitution. And then, like creatives, we, we didn't necessarily know what the direct message was. Halfway through the campaign, we realized, well, actually, people want to buy one and then give one. So we mm -hmm. were able to um, put in place that if somebody uh, kick-started the, the printing and of the Constitution, that they would be able to donate to their school or donate to a library. We had really great uh, promotional materials to, to incentivize people to, to back our Kickstarter. And we concluded the Kickstarter at the end of the summer. And we were able to get the Constitution printed by um, it's Constitution Day in September. I think it's September 17th. And so we were able to print and distribute 3,000 copies of the Constitution because we love getting ahead of ourselves and thinking about more things. We said, well, what if we did a poster show? <laughs> because we had done the posters for the Women's March. We had done this constitution. So we were like, let's do a poster show. And so one of our um, design directors at the time was like, that sounds wonderful. I used to work for Mirko Illich. Let's call him up. And he does poster shows around the country. Maybe he can help us get like 10 famous graphic designers to design a poster for each of the, the Bill, of, Bill of Rights. So we're like, yeah, that sounds great. So we sent our first email to Milton Glazer because we were like, why not? Let's get, let's get Milton to, yeah. to do a poster. Uh, and his studio wrote back and said, sure, that sounds great. <laughs> and so, of course, we were, we were very lucky that um, Milton, uh, I'm, I'm now on a first day basis with him, so Milton. Uh, no, Milton hey, Glazer's studio said that he wanted to uh, participate. And so then we sent out nine more requests to uh, folks like Seymour Quast, uh, Jessica Hish, uh, Jonathan Key. Adele Rodriguez, um, Yu Chen, and they all said yes. That's so awesome. 
Now, mind you, at the time, we weren't exactly sure what we were going to do with these posters. And we didn't we didn't say we were going to pay them or do anything. We were just like, we no. just want you to design it. Make and it, okay. it was actually absolutely incredible because every single person said yes. And they, no real questions asked. They were like, yes, we want to participate in this. We want to uh, be a part of something uh, that helps get folks engaged in civic liberties in understanding constitutional constitutional wow. rights and so we because i think four no three, i think it was three of the the artists in the in that made these posters went to the cooper union uh we were like well the cooper union they got all kinds of cool gallery spaces so we reached yeah. out to them and they were like absolutely let's do it so they ended up having uh two weeks uh in september available for us to do a free show of these posters Yep. So we had the opportunity to partner with a nonprofit called the Constitutional Sources Project, ConSource for short, and they were actually our partner in order to distribute the cons- the copies of the Constitution. They also were a partner in the show at the Cooper Union. Uh, so they helped us get uh, folks in the room uh, that this really would have an impact on. And we had a, a really amazing opening. And, um, you know, that was it was from when we started uh, on July 4th to September 17th, it was such a, an amazing uh, opportunity to see how design and creativity can impact the way that people talk about um, civic education and civic engagement and just the Constitution in general. Uh, and we learned an incredible amount. We learned so much about partnerships. We learned so much about how you pitch ideas to other designers, uh, how to collaborate. Um, and for me, like I said, it was one of my most favorite projects that I've ever, ever been a part of. Now the, for the people docu-series, was that related to, or was that an output of the constitution project? So, yes. So in, so this all happened, like I said, 2017, uh, and then in 2018, we worked with a couple of schools. There were some high schools uh, that were interested in taking the posters and taking the Constitution and using it in their curriculum. Uh, so we helped put on some shows um, uh, in, in some high schools in New York City. So that's kind of what we, we did with the project in 2018. At one point, I did have to kind of do a little time out and say, okay, we can't be the studio that only does the constitution. Uh, we have, we had some other client work and so we didn't, we needed to take a little pause. Uh, but then in 2019, so this past year, we started again, having a lot of conversations in the studio. That's like, okay, we're about to approach the next national election. We all feel like there are so many, um, so many causes and so many things happening in, in, in the country that need to uh, just have dialogue around them. And so we said, well, what can we do with our constitution project from 2017? How can we evolve it in 2020? And so in 2017, it really was, we said it was about looking at the rules and the rule book and like, how can you help people understand what those rules are? And as we move into March into 2020, we said that the rule book has sort of been thrown out. Like it's now really about interpretation. It's really about how people are understanding their constitutional rights, how people are understanding uh, how, uh, you know, the courts are shaped, how things are happening um, on the local level and the national level. So we said, well, how can we, how can we participate in that as designers? Because at the end of the day, we always go back to, okay, as designers, what is our role uh, in this larger conversation? And so when we started talking about interpretation, we realized, well, yeah, Interpretation is like the Constitution is all about interpretation. It is a living document. It is all about how we're interpreting the words of our of the founders. Um, and so we said, well, designers have a lot of stake in, uh, or creatives have a lot of stake in constitutional rights. I know the the number one being um, the First Amendment, freedom of speech. But there's so much. There's so many other uh, constitutional. Um, rights that affect us as creatives. So we said, well, let's, what if we did a video series uh, and we each month leading up to the election, uh, so starting in January all the way through October, what if we talk to creatives who are 
doing a type of interpretation uh, in their work and talk to them about their understanding of the Constitution. Uh, because right now it feels like anytime the Constitution is uh, talked about or, you know, civic education, it's always legalese. It's always feeling very like it's not, it's nothing to do with me. Um, but that's not true at all. So our first video was with uh, Adele Rodriguez, uh, who's the illustrator. Um, I think we there is an article that called him the illustrator in chief uh, mm. because he does so many um, illustrations and creative work based off of this Trump presidency. Um, you know, you look at his work, you know where he leans. Uh, but the work he's doing uh, is incredibly important uh, and is incredibly important to test the limits of what it means to be have freedom of speech and be able to put work out there. Uh, so we interviewed him uh, that went up in January. And um, the second video or the second interpreter uh, was uh, a gentleman named Mark Cross, who is a founder of a collective called Mud Guts, as well as a tattoo artist. So, again, somebody who's actually putting ink on bodies and yeah. really thinking about that uh, interpretation. We talked to him. He's in Williamsburg. So he's very much of the people and all that community. Uh, you know, for him, he he's, uh, I think. Tom called him a, po a post hippie. Um, he's, you know, very much about uh, how do we as people rise up and do the work we need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that was our second video, and then our third video actually is going to launch tomorrow. Yay! Well, tomorrow cool. as in I don't even know what day it is, but Friday of this week, <laughs> uh, we interviewed a chef, um, Mimi, who is incredible. She has done a tremendous amount of work. Uh, with women advocating for women in the kitchen, advocating for queer uh, individuals in the cooking space, and talks about how food really is our uh, common denominator. Like, how do we talk uh, about, or how do we use food to bring people together? And then, how do we make sure the people who are cooking the food and uh, who are preparing it and you know creating it are being represented and um, it, that's amazing. So that's our, our third video going up tomorrow. And then we're actually right now talking about our next three videos being, you know, at the time of, of COVID-19. So we want to make sure that we are addressing how people are feeling now and how people are thinking about connect, what connection means, uh, especially in this, this climate we're in um, and constitutional rights. Cause it's, that's, that's what it's all about. Well, yeah. Um, so with all of these really interesting, important things that you guys have had a chance to work on, what would you count as your proudest professional moment? So I feel like this is uh, a little uh, this is more personal for me. Um, so again, in terms of projects, 100% the Constitution Project and the ongoing, ongoing work, uh, as well as the clients. But um, one of the things that I that just this past year, 2019, was incredibly proud of. Um, I had a chance to speak at a um, conference, is the word. I had a chance to speak at a talk called Brand Stand. So I, I think I, I mentioned I was in the first year of the Master's in Branding program at the School of Visual Arts, which is celebrating its 10 year anniversary. Nice. So I was there 10 years ago. Uh, and about five years ago, I had a chance to be a part of the first alumni network because we talked about as, as alumni, how can we, uh, if we are shaping the modern practice of branding, how can we as alumni um, really foster that dialogue and put it up on stage? So we created something called Brand Stand. So each year we wanted to have a, a talk in um, November and bring in thought leaders uh, on the stage to talk about branding, to promote the branding program. And uh, this past year, I think it was its fourth, fourth year. And this was the first time that they asked an alumni to speak on stage, which was one of the first things that we talked about when we first were coming up with the idea of having an alumni talk, was we eventually wanted to be able to put the alumni on stage to uh, you know, promote, promote the work and promote the thinking and promote what we consider the next generation of brand thinkers. And so this past year, I yay, had the chance to be the alumni speaker. And it was, I felt like it was a lot of responsibility to, you know, mm -hmm. be able to speak on behalf of the 10 years of folks who have graduated from the program to also um, speak on topic that I 
you know, feel very passionate about the topic this year was belonging. And uh, I was so excited. But where when it came to reality was when, uh, you know, they were putting out the, the graphics for the for the event and I received it in my inbox and there was a picture of um, Debbie Millman, Stephen Heller, um, Bob Bland. And then there was me at the end of this <laughs> panel of speakers. That's so awesome. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I remember I sent it to my mother and, you know, I had been talking to my mom about it and she was like, that's great. That's great. I sent her the image and she was Stephen Heller. He's written a lot of books. <laughs> I was like, uh -huh. and my mom was like, well, what are you going to talk about? So that to me, that because it was in 2000, yeah, so it was last year, it was uh, at the SBA Theater with uh, uh, over, I think about 400 people, and I got to stand on that stage, I got to tell my story, I got to talk about the branding program, uh, and um, I even got a, a Twitter note afterwards from Stephen Heller telling me I did a great job. That is awesome. I wanted to frame it, I didn't, but I might... <laughs> And in between the time that he spoke and sent that tweet, he wrote another book. hundred <laughs> percent. I, th I think that's basically what his publishing schedule looks like. That is a hundred percent true. Well, um, maybe it's somebody you've already uh, mentioned at this point, but I'm curious if you have any design heroes. So, you know, um, if you had asked me 10 years ago, actually when I went into the brand new program, I would have had a long list of design heroes. Um, and they were always, I feel like when you say a hero, it's somebody who like you just dream about someday meeting mm -hmm. or just being around. Uh, and I have been incredibly fortunate and incredibly lucky over these past 10 years to meet a lot of those design heroes. Um, and not only meet, but get to know uh, and really get to um, engage with and experience with. And I realize in, in many ways, that I don't want to call them heroes because they're just, they are create their creative individuals doing important work. And by putting them up on a pedestal, it kind of, it takes away from seeing their, their process. Um, and so I think for me now, the design heroes are the designers of my studio every day because they're the ones that are, you know, cracking into briefs and design challenges. And they're the ones that are really trying to, uh, think about new ways to see the world. They're, they're thinking about what is, um, you know, the visual landscape in New York City going to look like in the next couple of years. Um, and they're not right now in any books. They're not in on yeah. stage. They're not talking about, you know, the last case study that they did at brand conferences, uh, but they are the ones that are doing it day in and day out. So for me, those are, are the heroes. But yeah, I do have my you know, Debbie Millman will always be top of the list. Uh, Stephen Heller, uh, you know. Yeah, well, and you know, the spoiler alert is um, I had a chance to do a talk about a year ago and I was I was talking about what I've interviewed on the show. And, it, you know, it's interesting that, you know, a lot of the people we've had on here have been design heroes of mine. And as you get to know these people, they're humans, <laughs> they're people. And, you know, it's it's very different than, um, than what, what you might expect. Like you, you look at the work and think they're like this untouchable, uh, entity that you just don't even know how to wrap your arms around. And then you get to know somebody and get to talk to them. You're like, Oh, they, they're just cool, normal people. So, yeah. Um, and, and you also realize that they're, they have such, uh, amazing people supporting them and behind them. Uh, and that's why for me thinking about, uh, these folks who have done so much work and I said, they have put blood, sweat and tears and they deserve to be up on stage and they deserve to be talking about their work and they mm -hmm. decades of, um, decades of uh, um, uh, great design work, but there are so many people that help them get there. There are so many designers, there's so many interns, there's so many uh, strategists, there's so many client service folks and producers. And I said, for me, I'm realizing that that is actually more interesting to find out their stories and how they supported uh, these, these heroes and these legends. Uh, and then what is the story behind uh, some of that work? Uh, and to your point, you know, yeah, every, everyone's human. Yeah. Right. Um, so 
one of my favorite questions to ask on the show um, of all of my guests is based on the idea of the the topic of the show to begin with, which is being obsessed. And so um, I find that we designers are a very obsessive lot <laughs> and we have obsessions that might change over time. But I'm curious what you find that you are most obsessed with right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, and you know, I, I recognize that we're we're doing this podcast amidst a, a, a global crisis. So I don't want to take down the sort of optimism down a notch. But I think something that I've really been thinking about over the past, um, especially few months, is just accountability and responsibility of designers. Uh, I think that something that has become very clear to me as I continue to progress in my career is how much access and privilege I've been given by going to two, you know, private art schools, by growing up upstate, by having, um, the opportunity to, um, or have, seeing all the opportunities I've been given. And I've now gotten to a point in my career where being an El Salvadorian woman with kids, with a husband, with a career, with a dog, is a really <laughs> important aspect of, of who I am. And uh, I was telling somebody the other day that uh, I definitely make people feel very comfortable with my story. Like I said, I, I'm mm-hmm. in, in the design field, I kind of check all the boxes uh, until I don't until they realize, right, your lived experience is an, as an El Salvadorian, five foot, really loud, um, as you've heard with my mic situation, um, really loud, <laughs> sometimes, um, you know, aggressive. Uh, it, that is sometimes now is, is a barrier because people are saying, okay, well, that's not what design leadership necessarily, that's not what I'm used to seeing in designers. That's not what I'm used to seeing as somebody who's running a design studio. Um, you know, there are very few women who own design studios and that's something that I want to, I want to do. I want to show a, as, I said, as a woman, as a woman of color that, uh, I should be owning my own studio. I should see what that looks like. Um, and, for me, there is that responsibility in the leaders who are developing, um, who are developing studios. Uh, they need to be looking at um, diversity, not only of perspectives, but just diversity ac- across the board. Uh, and then when I think of accountability, it's the accountability of designers to be thinking about the work that they're doing. Uh, I actually just... Um, my, uh, my my studio will will know. I've been talking about this this phrase. Design is dead inside, and it sounds so negative. And I and I'm usually I'm not a negative person, but I just have this fe- I just have this overwhelming feeling that as graphic designers and designers, we need to be doing more and speaking out more about what our role is as designers in the world that we're living, because we are seeing a erosion of trust from brands, uh, mm-hmm. from institutions, uh, from uh, disruptors, from people who, uh, you know, for this last decade have been held up as the future of where the world is going. And we're starting to see that that's not necessarily the case. And as people who understand creativity and the capacity of creativity, we need to recognize that the work that we're doing, the choices that we're making, all have a direct impact on uh, the world we're living uh, you know, as a package designer, you know, we are making, sing, we're doing a lot of labels on single use plastic and that there is uh, the reality of that responsibility of what does that mean? And that's not to say that tomorrow designers can wake up and, and decide they're only going to work on sustainable packaging. But I do think it's up to us and especially up to the, the this next generation to question what are the projects we're working on? What is our design being used for? What are the decisions that we're making and what does that impact? And I really am, I'm obsessed with how to get that conversation going in the design community uh, because I think we're a little behind. I mean, you're seeing it in the fine art community. You're seeing it with museums and galleries. They're starting to push the envelope on representation. They're starting to push the envelope on what their role is on shaping history. Uh, You're seeing it in um, other, again, other sectors of, of creativity, but I just feel like the design community could do more uh, and should be doing more. 
I could but keep going. I, well, I mean, as you think about doing more, I mean, you've done some pretty big, pretty important projects. Are there any, are there any dream projects that you have up your sleeve that you're kind of anxious to get after? Yeah. I mean, you know, not, there's not one big dream project, but something that I, and uh, Thought Matter, we've been thinking a lot about our community-based projects. Uh, something that we're always thinking about is how do you help people build trust with each other? How do you help people expand the curiosity uh, or their curiosity for the world around them? And for me, uh, it's how do we do more of that? And it could can't it couldn't be more important right now, especially as you and I are both uh, in isolation. We are um, quarantined. We're seeing what a global pandemic is doing across uh, across the world. And so community is going to be so important as we start to move out of this. We're going to start, have to start to think about how we connect with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually just saw the, the headlines about... Um, the satellites looking down on the the climate or, um, you know, the, I don't know what it's called, but just how the, the, the world right now is um, responding to less people out with less people on the roads. Even Venice, they were saying the, the, the yeah, I saw that, that the yeah. canals were clearing up and just yeah, and you a can couple see of the, days. <laughs> yeah. And you can see the fish. So to me, there's going to be a, a, a huge call to arms across the board for all of us to really think about how we build trust with each other. How do we expand our curiosity? How do we use creativity uh, in new ways? How do we use creativity to solve a lot of the challenges and uh, the uh, continued issues we're going to we're going to have? And I feel like it's designers and it's the creatives that are are, are need to be leading the charge because we have. Um, we have the tools to do it. I think that's awesome. Um, shifting gears a little bit. What is maybe a favorite piece of advice that you have received in your career or maybe a favorite piece of advice to pass along to uh, designers or strategists at Thought Matter? Good piece. I feel like I've, I've actually, again, been very fortunate to receive a lot of really amazing advice. Like I said, I've had a lot of really great mentors, but I think something that I t- talk a lot about in the studio, uh, especially when working with young designers and young strategists, um, is how not to be too precious about anything, how not to feel like, okay, I'm going to have this one solution that's going to be um, exactly what it should be. But instead, really trusting the process, uh, we talk a lot internally about this idea of an artful perspective. So how can we approach our work as artists approach, an artist approach work uh, with uh, a really open mind and and they know that there's going to be, uh, and this is fine artists, um, you know, they're, they're putting work out there. Uh, they know that they're going to, um, it's not going to be a hundred percent right. And they're going to, uh, work through, uh, whatever that, that is. And I feel like sometimes graphic designers and designers, because we're working on the computer or we're like doing something because it needs to uh, fit Mm -hmm. a set of parameters. We have a brief, we have timelines, we have this, and we feel like, oh, well, it just needs to like follow uh, a very linear way of doing it. But instead it's, how do you trust the process of creativity? How do you put work out there? How do you put ideas out there that might not be right? Um, they might not be, uh, perfect, but you uh, really have an open mind to refinement and iteration and uh, taking risks and being able to fail. Uh, and for me, that is so important right now because, again, you can't be too precious. You can't uh, expect to have the, the right answer right away, but instead really allowing it to um, grow over time. Even the Constitution project that I I told you it's a meandering project. Like it didn't have, it didn't really make any sense. Like I feel like if someone sat down and tried to map out what we did, uh, you would be like, no, that sounds like the silliest project I've ever heard of. Uh, but you know, three years later, it continues to uh, fuel conversation. And that really was not, that was not being precious. That was throwing ideas out there. That was like, yeah, let's email Milton Glazer. Um, and that really was about trusting the process and uh, making it happen. So. I think that's so, my advice. So the takeaway here is when in doubt, email Milton Glaser. <laughs> oh boy. Exactly. No, Milton, we're just kidding. If you're listening, we won't give away your email address. We promise. Um, <laughs> so maybe before we let you 
So I'm I'm guessing <laughs> that you might have something good for this one. Do you have any asks or encouragements for our audience and our listeners? I think no one should tell you that it can't be done because I feel like there's so many times um, that, you know, again, a crazy idea, you put a crazy idea out there or you put a crazy idea into the universe. That's like, I'm going to be in the first class of Debbie Millman's master's in branding. And there are a lot of people who are like, why would you do that? I think it was a 2009 when I applied right after Mm -hmm. it's a recession. Don't, Don't do that. More student loans. Do you need six figures of student loans? No. Um, but I, I always say to myself, like, if it feels right and I want to do it, I'm going to try it. I'm going to put it out there. And no one should tell you just it can't be done. No one should tell you that there's too many hurdles. No one should tell you that there are um, too many risks involved. I think if you are true to yourself and you're following your own path and you believe in it, you have to continue to strive for that and don't let anyone stop you. And I feel like that's what good or bad. That's how I feel like how I live my life. Yeah. Love it. Well, Jesse, where could um, our listeners connect with you, find you online, see more about the video series or find out about brand stand? Yeah, absolutely. So Instagram, I feel like is the the best for thought matter. Uh, we're always putting up um, our projects, especially the docu series. So we're at Thought Matter on Instagram, and me personally, I'm on. I like Twitter, um, so definitely reach me on Twitter. I'm at at Jesse McGuire. Um, so those would be the two two best places. And then Brandstand. Brandstand has, I think, their own social handles. So you could check out Brandstand. Um, I think it's Brandstand.com. And next year we'll be doing another amazing, uh, you know, another amazing talk at the SVA Theater. Uh, and definitely look out for the Masters in Branding program because, uh, as I mentioned, they're celebrating their 10-year anniversary. They just launched a new visual identity. Uh, they were hoping to have a conference, I think, um, um, because of everything that's happening, that's probably not in the cards. But there will be other uh, really amazing content going out from the Masters in Branding program because uh, we need... We need more people thinking about the modern practice of branding and where it's headed and where we're going. And yeah, that's awesome. I think um, I think I foresee a part two in this conversation where you and I just nerd out on brand stuff for like the entire conversation. Hundred percent. I have so many thoughts about branding. I have so many books <laughs> about branding. Um, yeah, I I love big brands, small brands, brands that don't even know their brands. Those are the best kind. Those are the best kind. Well, Jesse, it's been a pleasure chatting with you and I appreciate you being on here today. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. And thank you for giving me a break from Zoom meetings from all my family and uh, allowing me to just talk about what we're both obsessed with, which is design and branding. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks for being with us and thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 140 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.